meetings which spent days not only just trying to decide where one particular switch should go, but what the caption should be under the switch. And then they, de they decided, against the advice of the operators, in, the, in that case me, um, to put a caption under a vital switch, which made no sense to the air crew at all, and eventually, before we flew, it had to be changed. And this is a typical example of the uh, very simple, silly delays that occurred in the program. In the United States, the advanced technology and potential of TSR2 had been a source of concern, and progress of the project had been closely monitored. They sent a, a, um, a team over from the Pentagon in 1960 under um, uh, an official called Cortland Perkins, and uh, they expressed, they went all over the uh, TSR2 building, they expressed enormous enthusiasm. They let uh, <coughs> the British Aircraft Corporation, they let them, to un uh, let, let them understand that they would be interested in purchasing. They were nothing of the kind. They were interested in finding out what was going on uh, in order to adapt it <coughs> into their own version, which came much later and much less successfully the F-111. Now, I don't blame the Americans. Well, I think it's, been, it's become very clear since those days uh, that um, the Americans were primarily very worried about the emergence of TSR-2 because they saw it as a direct challenge uh, to the su military air supremacy that they were aiming to establish with their F-111 swing wing low-level attack airplane which was designed for a very similar role to TSR-2. Early in 1960, American industry was asked what the time seemed impossible. It was asked to design an airplane that would fly faster at any altitude than any existing fighter. It was behind it in time. It ran into enormous technical problems, and it overran, uh, overran its cost. Uh, predictions very very greatly but we know that the Americans thought that the TSR-2 was a threat that if we had been as successful with TSR-2 as we had been with its predecessor the Canberra which was so good if you remember that the Americans themselves bought t uh, the Canberra I think they saw the TSR as a threat to their potential worldwide interest in exporting military airplanes and they were very anxious to get rid of it The Australians, who had also purchased the Canberra bomber, found themselves in a similar position to the RAF in looking for a suitable replacement. I think the Australians needed to replace their Canberras, and therefore, uh, as they used it, they looked a bit and said, what are you doing? You must be replacing yours. I made two visits to Canberra with uh, teams from British Aerospace to make presentations on the TSR2 programme. Uh, during which we understand that they were um, uh, planning to acquire 30, 30 airframes. Royal Air Force was planning to have 150, and this 30 would have made a nice addition to, and, and made the production run really stable. Um, during the early part of 1964, was the year in which the uh, airplane first flew, we understood that the Australian government had virtually signed up uh, for a contract for TSR-2. After more than five years' work, the first prototype, XR-219, was transported in sections to the Aircraft and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire, where it would take three months to assemble. The choice of Boscombe Down as the site of the flight test program was a compromise solution. English Electric's base at Wharton in Lancashire would have been an ideal support and maintenance base. Vickers had wanted the first flight to take place from their airfield at Wisley. Roland Beaumont argued that the Wisley runway was too short. Working from Boscombe Down would create more problems. Nobody really wanted us there, or they did their very best to help us, I must say. We didn't want to be there. We had the worst of both communication worlds. We were 150 miles from Morton and 60 miles from Weybridge. 
uh, where we ought to have been doing all that work on one base with all the experts ju just round the block. The sum total of delays and resultant cost increases that were plaguing the project meant the planned in-service date had to be put back. This news poured further fuel on the fire of mounting opposition from the project's critics. Mountbatten, perhaps TSR2's most determined critic, was still pushing hard for the Buccaneer. He visited Australia and met their Defence Minister, Sir Frederick Scherger. He said that it would, uh, he went round the place saying that it was absolutely what the Air Force wanted and everybody knew this and he used to uh, go around with a briefcase with model, with, with, uh, with one model of the TSR2 and five of the Buccaneers and put them on the table in front of people like Scherger in Australia and say you can have five of these for one of those, so why do you bother? Mount Batten, to the best of my knowledge, told them that it wouldn't be coming into service um, or certainly poured cold water on it. The Australians listened to this and by the time we started flying in August uh, uh, we had been given to understand that the, the Australians were almost certainly shifting and going for the F-111. I'm sure they would have bought the TSR too, um, but they had it gone ahead. The newly assembled and freshly painted TSR-2 was wheeled out in September 1964 to commence its engine runs and taxi trials. Roland Beaumont and other members of his flight test team still had nagging concerns about the unresolved engine and undercarriage problems. The continuing build-up of political pressure and adverse media criticism was heightened by the looming general election with the ruling Conservative government looking set to lose. Meanwhile, a meeting was convened at Boscombe Down. In view of the October election and the Labour Party's uncertain support for the project, the question on everybody's lips was, when could TSR2 make its first flight? A successful flight before the election might prove critical to the project's survival. The chief project test pilot was faced with a very difficult decision. He was well aware of the dangers of an engine failure and of the consequences of cancellation. Don Bowen, my um, observer, uh, backseater, um, and I um, were the people on whom the total responsibility of this enormous pyramidal organization were going to fall on flight one. Uh, but it wasn't a, a sudden precipice to go over. We'd been doing taxi trials on the airplane, testing all its systems out on the ground. We'd taxied it up to take off speed, tested the parachute, the, brakes and all the rest of it. Um, by the time we were ready to fly on that day, uh, I had uh, any doubts about the, the, the capability of the aeroplane uh, had long since gone. Uh, I was very confident that it was going to fly well. Uh, an extraordinarily good moment when you turn onto the runway, you call for clearance to go, you get clearance from the tower, five, four, three, two, one, breaks off. You light the reheat and go, and from then on, you know exactly what it's supposed to do, and your task is just to be totally alert to see if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, it's a fascinating moment, it's a professionally enormously satisfying, and then when you become airborne and you find this new device